There is a great beast loose in the world of men. The beast has many heads, and on its heads are written names. Lockheed, Bell, Monsanto, Dow, Grumman, Colt, and many more. And they are very, very hungry. Punisher, Born, Issue Number 4, by Garth Ennis and Derek Robertson. Hello, I am the Pop Mythologist, and this is the end. Just a quick correction there about the work that I quoted from. I called it Punisher Born. It's actually technically just called Born, but I don't know, there's something about that one word title in which if you just say it without any context, it sounds kind of weird. So, <laughs> at least to my ears. So I just arbitrarily added the word Punisher at the front to give it a little bit of context, but the title technically of the work is simply Born. And as indicated, it is a limited series comic about the Marvel character Punisher. And as is probably obvious by now, the Punisher is the topic of today's episode. But since this is a podcast about pop culture and collapse, I will be talking about the Punisher in relation to collapse. And so hopefully that'll be interesting for you listeners out there. So as you may or may not realize, but you probably do realize if you are a pop culture nerd, uh, we just had San Diego Comic-Con happen last weekend, or SDCC as it's known, which is the, or at least it used to be, the biggest con in the U.S. Someone at the con told me that it has now been overtaken by, I think, New York Comic-Con as the biggest con in the U.S., purely in terms of attendance numbers. I haven't been able to like corroborate that. I don't know for sure, but um, it may very well be the case. In any event, it's a gigantic pop culture con. I mean, it essentially takes over the entire city for that weekend. And I was able to go for just one day. Ideally, I would have loved to have gone for the entire con, but for lots of reasons I won't get into, I was only able to attend for one day on a Saturday. And I also happened to be on a panel. Uh, in which the topic of discussion was a number of Marvel's street-level characters. So street-level characters being people like Daredevil, Jessica Jones, Luke Cage, The Punisher, and so forth. And it was a comic arts conference panel. So the comic arts conference is a, sort of like a sub-conference within San Diego Comic-Con that is more academic in nature and specifically focuses on just comics. So whereas there are tons of panels at SDCC and people talk about all kinds of stuff, ranging from movies and video games and everything under the sun, at a comic arts panel, you can only talk about comics because the comic arts conference is devoted to the medium of sequential art or comics. So I was on one of those. And just a quick shout out to Dr. Scott Jordan, a good friend of mine from Illinois State University, who asked me to be on the panel. And also a shout out and thank you to Dr. Shelley Clevenger, who was actually originally supposed to be on the panel talking about the Punisher. Dr. Clevenger, if you're new to this podcast, also happened to be the guest of my last episode, in fact. We don't talk about the Punisher in that episode. We talk about a different work and a different issue. But nevertheless, that episode is there for you to enjoy. Unfortunately, Shelley was not able to attend the con due to something that came up at the last minute. And so Scott Jordan asked me to fill in for her. And, and when I was thinking about which character I would talk about, I actually thought, you know what? Uh, I'm probably not going to be able to do as good a job as my friend Shelley in talking about the Punisher, but I think I'm going to talk about the Punisher. And um, I, I say that I probably wasn't going to be able to do as good a job because Shelley is the number one Punisher fan and is a true expert on the character. I am a fan, but I don't know that I would necessarily call myself an expert. And so even though I knew that I wouldn't be able to do as good a job as Shelley, I thought, okay, I'm going to try my best and decided that I was going to talk about the Punisher. 
So I wasn't necessarily thinking that I was going to do a podcast episode about it as well. But what happened is that just with the nature of panels at these cons, the way they happen is sometimes, you know, it's really easy to lose track of time. And especially have a number of panelists, it's just kind of hard to keep everything kind of really tight and on schedule. And so sometimes you end up with not as much time as you might like. And so I had prepared a segment that I didn't really have enough time left to talk about. And so I kind of rushed through it. And partly because of that, I, I thought it wasn't all that great until later. Uh, one of the audience members said to me, and I got to give a special shout out to this individual. So Dr. Michael Kurslov, who I believe also was involved in, I'm not sure if it was either a panel or just one of the events, but um, uh, was involved with the comic arts conference as well. And Michael is teacher chair of the English department at Platteview High School in uh, Springfield, Nebraska, I think it is. But I just wanted to say thanks to Michael because uh, if it hadn't been for him, I probably wouldn't be doing this episode. But but he came up to me later and he said, hey, you know, I, I got to say that was really interesting. And I was looking around the room and kind of getting a feel for what the audience was feeling. And I think we could all agree that we all wanted to hear more. And um, I kind of was surprised by that. I, I didn't think uh, I had done that great a job. And the fact that Michael said it was that interesting is that, you know what, maybe I will do a podcast episode on this and give it the full kind of attention and time that I think the topic deserves. And also, it just happened to be relevant to the topic of the podcast as well, because Punisher is obviously a part of pop culture. And what I was talking about was very much a collapse related issue. I mean, very, very much. And so here we are. And I want to make clear that just with the nature of comic book characters, you know, like what they symbolize and what they're all about, it changes as different writers get hired by the publisher to write the character. And so the Punisher has had many iterations throughout history of the character in Marvel Comics, and all kinds of writers have been at the helm. I am going to be drawing from Garth Ennis's vision for the character specifically because Garth Ennis did a number of different runs on the Punisher, but specifically I am focusing only on Garth Ennis's run on the Punisher Max. There was a separate imprint called the Max imprint that Marvel did for a while. And this was an imprint where they let writers take beloved Marvel characters like Punisher, um, you know, Jessica Jones, Black Widow, whoever, and write very mature and often dark stories about them. And uh, so for adult readers, often you were able to get a level of sophisticated, mature storytelling that you couldn't necessarily always get in sort of like the, the mainline Marvel comics universe. Comics excel at confusing people like no other medium, especially beginners or people who aren't like hardcore fans. I and mean, even veteran readers of comics get confused. For example, if you're going to, into the Marvel Unlimited app and you type in Punisher, we're going to get a bunch of different results, like different series because, uh, well, Marvel and DC anyway, are constantly launching, finishing, relaunching, rebooting different series with the same title. That's why I'm saying Garth Ennis, Max imprint that began in 2004. Um, <laughs> it's all the more confusing because under the Max imprint, there was another title actually called Punisher Max. And that's not the one I'm talking about. That was written by Jason Aaron, who is also a very good writer, but is irrelevant to the current topic at hand. But first, a quick word on spoilers, because I always like to explain whether there will be spoilers or not. So the works that I'll be drawing from are, there are three of them. Uh, the first is the entire run by Garth Ennis in The Punisher Max. So that would be issues number one through number 60. And Punisher Born, issues number one through four by Garth Ennis and Derek Robertson. That was published in 2003. And finally, the Punisher, The End, a fitting title for this podcast. 
The Punisher, The End by Garth Ennis and Richard Corbin, published in 2004. And that was a one-shot comic. One-shot meaning like a single issue. Of all those works that I mentioned, the only one where I might say some things that might be minor spoilers would be the last one. The Punisher, The End. Issue number one, that would be the only one. And even in that one, I would argue that there's some things I would say that might seem like spoilers at first, but actually are not. And that's because there's some stuff just even in the synopsis of the comic itself that explicitly make clear that this is an apocalyptic story. It's very much about the end of the world and just the way that it's written. There's really no question of whether the world's going to be saved or not. It's obviously the apocalypse. So most of what I say, I think, regarding Punisher, the end, will actually not be spoilers, even if it seems like it at first. But there might be a couple of things that could be maybe understood as spoilers. I, I, I hesitate because sometimes it's like even when you're trying to be careful, and I do try to be careful, it's hard to know at times. I think generally speaking, uh, we as fans are a, a little more sensitive these days than we used to be in the past regarding spoilers and understandably, I think it's justified, but uh, it does make it hard sometimes to how to go about spoiler warnings and trying to figure out, okay, wait, is that a spoiler or is it not? Or <laughs> it's um, pretty challenging, but um, so I don't think there will be any spoilers about most of the works, except that one comic, the Punisher, the end issue number one. And even then I would argue that most of it will not be spoilers. But as always, uh, please do use your own discretion. You know yourself. If you feel like you just like to be careful and are sensitive to spoilers, then maybe hold off on listening to this episode until you have read that comic. Or, you know, honestly, I feel that for most of the listeners of this podcast, probably you're not going to read The Punisher, the end issue number one. Uh, some of you might be big fans of comics or of The Punisher, and, and in which case, I would definitely recommend reading it, but a lot of listeners probably really won't read it. And it, there again, I don't think there's anything I'm going to say that's going to spoil it. And for all of these works, I will be quoting from them and I will be discussing specific moments and panels that are in these comics, but I won't give away any essential developments or revelations. Okay. And for those who haven't read those works, but would like to, uh, the easiest way is instead of trying to track down the individual back issues, just get the collected editions. And so, the, and the easiest way to do that, since even that is kind of confusing, um, just comics make everything confusing, um, is to get these four complete collections that were published for Garth Ennis's run on Punisher Max. So that would be Punisher Max, the complete collection, volume one, volume two, Volume 3 and Volume 4. And those include the Born storyline, Born issues number 1 to 4, and it includes the Punisher, the end one shot comic as well. So by getting those four complete collections, you would be getting every relevant work that is discussed in this episode. Or you can just not read them, and I think you would still find the discussion contained herein. Uh, interesting, hopefully. Now, one of the co-creators of The Punisher, Jerry Conway, once had a quote where he said, the Punisher represents a failure of the justice system, end quote. Now, that does tend to be the one of the more popular interpretations of the character. It's one that I happen to largely agree with, but I'll be presenting a different viewpoint today one that really isn't talked about that much in relation to The Punisher, but that I think is a legitimate one and also doesn't necessarily contradict or go against what Jerry Conway was saying. It also doesn't contradict what I know my friend Shelley would have said with in relation to The Punisher. Shelley, drawing from her expertise in criminology and victim studies, would talk about The Punisher in relation to justice for victims. And that, too, is an interpretation I agree with. And it uh, actually coexists quite nicely with the interpretation that I'm about to talk about. So the basic thesis that I'll lay out and then try to defend is that for Garth Ennis, 
the Punisher is an anti-capitalist symbol. Now, I want to be clear that it's not that the character is written in such a way in which he's consciously going around thinking, I hate capitalism and I'm going to bring it down. It's not that he's consciously thinking about that. He does have some conscious thoughts that are close to that, but not exactly that. Okay. But what a character is consciously thinking and what that character actually represents for the writer are two different things and don't necessarily coincide. So the best place to start with an exploration of this is in the Bourne storyline, which I quoted from at the beginning of the episode. Uh, the Bourne storyline is Garth Ennis's reimagining of Punisher's origin story. The conventional origin story for the Punisher is that his, you know, he was an ex-soldier, uh, an elite soldier, you know, like Navy SEAL, Marine, all that kind of thing. And uh, his family gets murdered by criminals. And that gets him started on his personal vendetta against the criminal world. But for Garth Ennis, that's really just the trigger event. Really, his true origin goes back all the way to the Vietnam War, in which Frank Castle, the real life name of the Punisher, in which Frank fought as a captain of a, I don't know what you call it, like platoon, squad, whatever. It's a team of soldiers. And in Bourne, Garth Ennis lays out how he essentially sees war and crime as two sides of the same coin. The commonality underlying both war and crime is that both are horrific on a massive scale and cause untold amounts of suffering. But for the key players who are responsible for them, they are a tremendous source of profit and power. And for Garth Ennis, neither war nor crime are aberrations of capitalism, but it's logical business outcomes. Now, I'm going to talk more about that, but first I want to provide a little bit of context about Garth Ennis, which is that the stuff about capitalism is not something I am projecting onto this writer. I mean, if you read his works, not just in The Punisher, but also in other books such as The Boys, which has been adapted into a popular show on Amazon Prime, uh, Ghost Rider even, um, Hellblazer, which is a great comic that he wrote for and happens to be one of my favorites. It's very clear that Garth Ennis is not a fan of capitalism. I don't know that necessarily he is an advocate of you know trying to bring it down or whatever, but it, it is clear that he's not a fan of it. So Ennis, throughout his run on The Punisher and the Max imprint, ongoingly explores this belief in war and crime as being um, cousins of each other or two sides of the same coin, the coin being capitalism. And there are so many great moments scattered throughout the entire series that demonstrate this, but there's one beautiful set of panels in the Bourne storyline that I just referred to. There are these two panels, one on top of the other, and there are like they're mirror reflections of each other, the way they're framed. And the top one, the top panel contains two soldiers. There's a close-up of two soldiers, very sympathetic characters. They're just grunts in the Vietnam War, just want to go home, right? And one of them is holding like the almighty dollar. And below that panel are two characters. Again, they're framed you know, in complete reflection of the two characters above it. And they too are nominally soldiers, but they're actually criminals. They run a drug operation and they exploit, take advantage of soldiers' misery and desire to escape the horrors of the war by pushing heroin. And so these two panels are kind of like, for me, the sort of beautiful symbolization of Garth Ennis's view of war and crime as being two sides of the same coin. And I want to expand on that quote that I opened today's episode with because it's really terrific and just kind of encapsulates Garth Ennis's view of the way capitalism works. So, quote, there is a great beast loose in the world of men. It awoke in dark times to fight a terrible enemy. It stormed through Europe, across the far Pacific, and crushed the evil that it found there underfoot. But when it was victorious, when the crooked cross 
and the rising sun were done with, the great beast's keepers found that it would not go back to sleep. The beast has many heads, and on its heads are written names, Lockheed, Bell, Monsanto, Dow, Grum, and Colt, and many more, and they are very, very hungry. So the great beast must be fed, and every generation our country goes to war to do just that. A war for war's sake, one that could have been avoided. But there must be blood, in extraordinary quantities, and whether it is foreign or American is of no consequence at all. End quote. And so that's the complete quote, which I kind of edited for brevity to read at the beginning of the episode, but that is a complete quote that is written across a series of panels in the Bourne comic in a very, very kind of disturbing and horrific way, juxtaposing against these horrific images of soldiers just being slaughtered. There are moments and passages just like this all throughout the Bourne storyline, and it's just, I, I mean, I don't know how, um, it, it's so obvious that for Garth Ennis, war is this twisted, horrific means for the ruling elite, the ruling class, to feed the beast, but really feed their own insatiable appetites for endless, never-ending growth and power and wealth. And to feed this beast, regular business is not enough. You need something on a massive scale like war. And even with war being as massive as it is, uh, it isn't enough to have just one war and be done with. You need a war per generation every couple of decades to continually feed that beast because it just keeps waking up and it's never satiated for long. And Frank Castle, aka the Punisher, comes to see how his soldiers' lives are nothing but fodder for feeding the beast. And so he is depicted as being a very committed leader, someone who's very dedicated to the lives and safety of his soldiers. And so for him to see that for the powers that be, his soldiers' lives are, and his own, are basically nothing, is kind of like the beginning of his rude awakening. So when you're the ruling class, and when you're trying to wage essentially perpetual war, what you need are perpetual soldiers, right? The problem is most soldiers, the average soldier, doesn't want to fight war. They want to go home. They want to serve their time and just go back to their lives, right? Rare is a soldier who signs up again and again and again, as Frank Castle does. And the reason that he does is that for Frank, war provides him with a sense of meaning and purpose. It is actually his deepest psychological driver. And this actually makes sense in, in a lot of ways. There have been like books and papers written about this, war as a kind of vehicle for meaning. And it's not necessarily that people like Frank just enjoy killing for its own sake. It's that struggle, right? And whatever meanings they may, meanings and narratives they might imbue with it, or just might be like the actual physical struggle itself that provides a sense of meaning. There are a number of ways that that can occur on a psychological level as well, in which struggle and adversity itself kind of provides you with a sense of purpose and meaning. And so Frank is therefore an ideal soldier because you get more bang for your buck. But from the perspective of the system, you get the most bang for your buck from a soldier like Frank who uh, happily, willingly keeps re-enlisting and serving multiple tours of duty. And he's actually a perfect creation of the system, someone who wants to fight and never wants to stop. So uh, again, despite perpetual war being kind of like this condition of capitalism through Garth Ennis's eyes, conventional wars do eventually end, at least until the next one, but there's a period of time in between. Well, what if you were a soldier like Frank who finds their deepest sense of meaning in fighting and never wants to stop. You see this internal struggle going on in a sequence of panels in the Bourne storyline where he comes to terms with the fact that he is someone who kind of relishes the adversity, the struggle, the fighting, and um, knows that the war is going to 
in. And so what's he going to do then? Therefore, the conventional origin story of his family getting murdered just becomes like an excuse. It kind of points the way for the perpetual war that he was seeking. And it works out perfectly because, again, as mentioned, crime is the other side of the coin of capitalism. War is the other one and crime is the other one. Again, they both profit off of suffering and exploitation. And whatever we, we might think of Frank Castle as a character, Garth Ennis shows that he has his own very strong set of morals and ethics. You know, he has his own sort of moral worldview in which suffering, it, the causing of suffering is a crime that should be punished. One of the best moments in which this is captured in the dialogue is in a storyline that Garth Ennis wrote called Valley Forge, Valley Forge. And this story can be found in volume four of the Punisher Max Complete Collection. And in this storyline, there's a sequence or there's a moment in which this army colonel entrusted with the task of capturing Frank, his name's Colonel Ho, he kind of sits Frank down um, in handcuffs, of course, and says or asks the question that everyone wants to know about Frank's psychology, which is, uh, why? And Frank responds, so they can't walk away. So they can't profit from the pain they've caused. So it is the direct and intentional profiting off of suffering on a massive scale that unites war and crime as being essentially the same thing or two sides of the same coin and which completely goes against Frank's moral sensibility and gives him that great excuse to fight a perpetual war, which he craves because crime never ends. Again, war, you know, you could be waging a perpetual war, but there are these moments in between the actual wars. But crime is just ongoing, again, because it's kind of a logical outcome of capitalism. So Frank has this endless war that he doesn't ever have to stop. All throughout the Punisher Max, many of the adversaries that Frank fights are the same warmongers, or at least they come from the same class, the same ruling class of warmongers who essentially created Frank. Because remember, it's a system of perpetual warfare and you need soldiers to fight those wars. And so you create people like Frank. And there's a core group of specific individuals, in fact, these generals who are not really soldiers like Frank because he kind of has a soft spot for other soldiers. But these generals, in his own words, are not soldiers. They are businessmen. They are executives of corporations. And they are the central adversaries of Garth Ennis's run on the Punisher Max. They are there from the very beginning. And they are there in the background all throughout, continually reappearing, even amidst like Frank's other battles with more sort of localized, small scale, like mafia type people or whatever. This group of wealthy business executives are there lurking there, like pulling strings in the background the entire time. And eventually, in the final storyline that Garth Ennis writes for the Punisher Max, Frank finally comes up directly against them, right? He, he meets his makers, um, essentially. And in this sense, the Punisher Max, as written by Garth Ennis, kind of resembles Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, titled Frankenstein or the Modern Prometheus. So I'm referring directly to the novel here and not really the movie versions. And the novel, uh, in particular, kind of explores this relationship in which the monster created by Dr. Frankenstein, even though he's the product of the creator, he kind of comes to be the bane of that creator and comes to be the source of that creator's undoing. And there's, there's a similar dynamic going on with the Punisher and this imperialistic capitalist ruling class that created him and others like him. And so the perfect soldier created by the system for its own purposes of profit and power 
is now, just like Frankenstein's monster, the cause of that system's undoing and eventual destruction, as we see in Punisher The End, number one. This was published in 2004 by Garth Ennis and artist Richard Corbin. Again, I apologize for like non-comic readers. If this all this references to these different titles is making your eyes glaze, there's really no way to avoid it if I want to be citing specific works, which I want to do because I don't want to be just like sloppy and just be like, oh, it's just somewhere in the Punisher books, you know, you can find this. I want to be specific so you can actually go there and find it yourselves. But this entire cycle of the creation of the system becoming the source of that system's destruction reaches its culmination in Punisher The End, which is a futuristic dystopian storyline. And uh, so Punisher The End takes place in an apocalyptic future in which basically capitalism has run its full natural course, resulting in devastation of the earth. And there's a great passage in Punisher The End which captures this. And it goes, quote, once upon a time, there was a bunch of evil fucks. Hardly anyone knew because they were so good at keeping it quiet. But these particular evil fucks owned the world. They ran the great industries that poisoned the air. Their businesses turned whole countries into slaves. The money they made could have fed and healed the population of the earth twice over. But all they could think to do was hoard it. They made puppets out of presidents and started wars for profit. And one day, inevitably, they pushed the planet's luck too far. And this is an internal monologue, uh, end quote, sorry. Uh, that is the internal monologue going on within the mind of the Punisher as he is dishing out justice to those who have brought about the destruction of the earth and its people and living creatures through their reckless, endless exploitation of it. They are the ruling class, portrayed by Garth Ennis and Stephen Corbin as wealthy, powerful individuals, uh, the very embodiment of the capitalist ruling class. And even though, as I've been arguing, it, this connection for Garth Ennis between capitalism and war and crime and exploitation and devastation is made very clear all throughout his entire run, it reaches its ultimate expression and sort of in-your-face obviousness in The Punisher at the End, which, as I've said, is the kind of logical culmination of uh, the vision of The Punisher that Garth Ennis lays out. So something that I find really interesting is that this vision of the Punisher is symbolic of a number of ways that neoliberalism is destructive of life itself and the entire planet, but perhaps best represented by climate change or you know, the climate crisis in which you have something that is very much primarily the cause of this never-ending drive for constant growth and profit on a finite planet with finite resources. You can only exploit it so much. But that process under capitalism never stops. It just always looks for something more to exploit. When you're done exploiting that, then you exploit that. You find another way to exploit that. Hence, the, the, the way we will see even solutions to climate change being exploited for profit. And so climate change as a product, in one sense, of or, or natural logical outcome of capitalism and its excesses is now the very threat that may undermine and cause it to collapse. And in fact, uh, Marx, of course, even though he may not have been able to foresee the specific ways that climate change is manifesting, pretty much predicted this way back when he was writing about capitalism and the internal contradictions that would cause it to eventually sort of implode upon itself, even if you don't necessarily have people trying to actively undermine it. It's just by its own contradictions, it will collapse. And so the Punisher is kind of symbolic of that in which he is the product 
of a system that seeks constant, never-ending profit and growth and power, using war as a tremendously effective and efficient means to feed that insatiable appetite, and then Frank, the Punisher, as a creation of that system, as a soldier created to fight war for the sake of profit for the capitalist ruling class, now comes to become the very source of that system's destruction because, again, crime and war are the same, essentially. So having made that primary point, I want to kind of spend a little bit of time on the very interesting debate, I guess, of the ways in which in recent years, the Punisher's iconography, the symbol and logo of the Punisher has been co-opted by right-wingers. And the irony of that, when we are looking at this vision of the Punisher created by Garth Ennis, is that, you know, despite a lot of sort of liberal comic readers counter arguments that the Punisher is not by any means a fitting symbol for the right wing. Uh, actually, this version of the Punisher kind of is, but not in the way that those right wingers think. So among the professed values that conservatives and reactionaries profess to believe in are values such as personal choice, personal responsibility, and personal liberty and freedom. And there is a natural consequence to choices and decisions, and therefore it is imperative to make better choices and decisions, or so goes the argument. Well, the Punisher <laughs> represents natural consequence in the works that I've discussed in this episode. That, again, that system which has created a tool and a product, Frank Castle, to do its work now has to, whether it wants to or not, has to face the consequences of that in which the creation of the system is now destroying it. And that is natural consequence. That is the consequence of the choices and the decisions that those in power have made and a natural result of the values that they have prioritized. So the Punisher is defending you know, so-called conservative values, but again, not in the way that they probably imagine it, right? I don't think anyone really on the right thinks of capitalism as an intrinsically destructive and exploitive system, the sort of unintended consequences of which will be the very collapse of that system. And there you have it. That is my analysis of the Punisher as envisioned by writer Garth Ennis as a symbol of a complete system collapse brought about as a natural and logical consequence of free market capitalism. The very creations of capitalism will be the cause of that collapse. So I hope you found that analysis interesting. I know it's not the usual way that the Punisher is discussed. Usually the kind of conversations that I've heard on podcasts are things like all this is Punisher, is he or isn't he a psychopath and things like that. And those discussions are valid, but they're very common. And I have come to find them to be not so interesting anymore. And so this has been a different viewpoint of the Punisher. And again, thank you for my friends, Dr. Scott Jordan, for inviting me onto his panel and to Dr. Shelley Clevenger for giving me her blessings to talk about her favorite character of whom as mentioned, she is the true authority. And I'm just a average fan trying to present a interesting and unique viewpoint. Until next time, I am the pop mythologist, and this is the end. <laughs>